Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, so this is obviously joint work with, with Richard Rogerson. Let me just jump right in. Um, so this figure is the, the motivation for, for our paper. It shows the mean uh, employment rate for men aged 55 to 64 in a balanced panel of 14 OECD countries going back to 1976. And you see these dramatic changes. So the, uh, the mean employment rate for men uh, in this age group declined by more than 15 percentage points between 1976 and 1995 only to increase by almost as much uh, between 1995 and 2019. And when you factor in that uh, the employment rate uh, for men in this age group had been declining for several decades already prior to 1976, this reversal is particularly striking. The goal of our paper is to shed light on this dramatic shift, to shine a light on this dramatic shift in, in, in labor supply. Uh, and to present a broad narrative to, to explain these, these uh, employment dynamics. To gauge uh, the extent to which the mean reflects the experience of the individual countries, here uh, we've plotted the time series uh, of um, male employment uh, for the age group 55 to 64 in our, in our 14 countries. This is five-year uh, moving averages. And what you see is this uh, tendency toward a, a U-shaped uh, pattern in almost all of the countries, but also a lot of heterogeneity in the magnitude of these, these changes. We argue that these, this qualitative similarity across countries um, speaks to, to common factors driving these dynamics, but the quantitative differences across countries could prove helpful uh, in guiding our search for, for candidate um, factors. So textbook explanations of this several decades long decline in the employment rate of older men typically stresses two, two factors, namely the expansion of social security uh, and secular increases in incomes. Now, it should be noted that these forces have operated alongside uh, with secular trends that likely serve to increase employment among older individuals, namely improvements in health and longevity and increases in educational attainment. Interestingly, there's been no widespread trend reversal or trend break, or there was no um, widespread trend reversal or trend break in the mid 90s in any of these forces. Granted, there have been some changes to formal social security rules uh, in some of the countries, um, but that doesn't go very far toward, toward understanding kind of just how widespread these patterns are or, or the magnitudes of these changes um, that I just showed you. So all of this taken together um, means that this trend reversal in the employment rate of older, older men is really viewed as, as a puzzle in the literature. And in fact, it has you know, cause some researchers to look for potential new trend factors. And one of those, uh, or one of the more prominent ones, is rising female employment. And I'll return to that uh, in, in just a minute. But let me first talk about um, our narrative. So while we certainly don't um, dispute the common wisdom that expansions to social security and increases in, in incomes were the driving forces behind the decline in older men's employment throughout the 1900s, um, we would argue uh, that one shouldn't just assume that those continue to be the dominant forces in the 1970s and 1980s. Our narrative builds on the shocks and in institutions literature, which, uh, which um, uses the, which takes the, which builds on the, um, the, uh, uh, the sorry, which uh, takes the, um, uh, the, the gosh, the distresses the overall worsening of the, uh, of the labor market outcomes uh, in response to a common shock or series of shocks. And then the, uh, uh, of course, the, um, the institutional heterogeneity, uh, which influenced how, how those shocks uh, were propagated differentially across, across countries. Now, 
Additionally, uh, we stress the role of heterogeneous responses in institutions, um, specifically what we term shadow social security systems. So what do we mean by shadow, shadow social security systems is programs that accommodated effective retirement prior to the normal retirement age and entry into, into formal social security. So to summarize, um, we argue uh, that the dynamics that I showed in that, that initial motivating figure are the sum of at least three processes, namely uh, a trend component reflecting kind of the standard secular forces that, that I, I just mentioned, um, low frequency but mean reverting negative shocks to labor market opportunities that affected all age groups, but particularly older individuals, and uh, a temporary shock to, to institutional features uh, in a subset of countries that amplified the, um, the common shock, um, particularly for the, the men aged 55 to, to 64. So going back I, uh, to, to this, these potential new trend factors, which I alluded to, and, and namely the, the role of rising female employment. And the, the narrative there is that, you know, going back to, to say the 1960s, women entered the labor market in increasing numbers and with differential career expectations. Um, and if you take the, the cohort that turned 20 in 1960, um, they turned uh, 55 in, in 1995. And so it's around that time that men aged 55 to 64 were increasingly likely to be married uh, to a woman who, who worked, who engaged in market work. To the extent that uh, the higher employment rate of women in the mid 90s um, can be attributed to factors that took place several decades before, um, this plausibly could be viewed as exogenous from the perspective of, of um, events in, in the mid 90s. Take that together with the assumption that the leisure times of spouses are complements or the non-market work times of spouses are complements, then rising employment among older women has the potential to explain the, the trend reversal in older men's employment. So as a, as a first step here, what we plot is the uh, mean employment to population rate show for men and women aged 55 to, to 64 in our, uh, in our panel of, of 14 countries. And what you see is that this trend, rever uh, trend break occurs at roughly the, the, essentially the same time for, for both men and women. So at a first pass, this seems to support uh, this, this narrative. However, we would argue that a closer look at the data cast out on um, the role of leisure complementarities or rising female employment as the dominant force behind the rise in older men's employment. If leisure complementarities were the driving force, you would expect single men and married men to look very different in the data. However, we show that the timing and the magnitude of the trend reversal um, was effectively the same for, for married men, married and cohabiting men as it was for, for single men. Additionally, we use uh, lag, the lagged employment rate for women aged 45 to 54 to control for, for cohort effects and show that the increase in um, women's employment in the age group 55 to 64 started at least 10 years or so uh, later than, than one would, would expect. So let me show you that evidence. Um, so here, what we have is a plot of um, the, um, uh, the employment uh, rates for men age 55 to 64 for, for men, married men or cohabiting men uh, and, and single, men's, single men re respectively. Uh, in a subset of, of, of six countries. Um, and what you see here is that all six panels uh, tell the same story. Namely, although there are certainly level differences in the employment rates of married and single men, the timing and magnitude of the trend reversals are, are very similar um, 
for, for married and, and, and single men. So while uh, we don't, what, what, so while leisure complementarities can certainly play some role, um, we are, in light of this, it seems unlikely that they're the, they're the dominant force. We view this uh, in and of itself as, as rather persuasive evidence, uh, but let me also show you a second, second piece of, of evidence. Um, so here what we have is we use the growth in the employment rates of women aged 45 to 54 between years T minus 10 and T minus um, one to proxy for the exogenous component of the growth in the employment rate for women uh, aged 55 to 64 between years T and T plus nine. And so what this figure shows you is that the employment rate of older women, women aged 55 to 64, was depressed relative to trend in the period leading up to the, the mid 90s. So our analysis suggests that um, the female employment dynamics are part of the, the larger puzzle rather than the solution that's, that's been proposed in the previous literature. Let me, let me now show you um, uh, evidence in support of our narrative, which we term Shocks and Institutions 2.0. So the, uh, the first fact that we establish is that the trend change uh, in mean male employment in the mid 90s was not limited to the age group 55 to 64, although it was most pronounced for that age group. So the left graph zooms in as an illustration, zooms in on the age group 35 to 44. And there you see this, this decline in, in male employment through the mid 90s followed by a modest recovery that's ultimately disrupted by, by the Great Recession. The right-hand graph shows you the, employment, the evolution of the employment rate for men for, for the different age groups. And what you see is this is a common pattern across all age groups, with the exception of the 15 to 24-year-olds, where we see more of a leveling off rather than a recovery in the mid-90s. The second fact that we establish is that countries with the largest decline in the employment uh, rate of prime aged men prior to the mid 90s also experienced the largest decline in the employment rate of older men. So computing the correlation coefficient between the declines in the employment rates of men aged 35 to 44 and 55 to 64 between 1976 and 1995 we get a correlation coefficient of just under 0.7. So these first two facts taken together suggest that at least part of the decline in the employment rate of older males between 1970 and, and the mid 90s uh, should be interpreted as a response to negative aggregate shocks to the overall labor market. So the third fact that we establish is that countries with the largest decline in employment for older men prior to the mid 90s also experienced the largest subsequent increase. So we compute the, the correlation between the decline and the increase on either side of the minimum and get a correlation coefficient of just under 0.5. So if the increase in the mid 90s or following the mid 90s was due to the appearance of a new trend factor. There's little reason to expect um, that, that, that that new factor, the, cha the changes associated with that new factor would be correlated with changes associated to the factors that operated earlier. Rather, we take this as evidence highlighting the role of institutional responses to the overall worsening of the labor market conditions. And that's what I'll, I'll talk about, about next. So at this point, you might be wondering if what our narrative is just a minor extension of the shocks and institutions narrative with a particular focus on, on older individuals. Um, and it's certainly reasonable to, 
to, to posit that that age group would be more affected by, by, by a common shock. So while that, that narrative gets one quite far, we argue that something extra is needed. And in particular, that heterogeneity in institutional changes that directly affected older individuals would help account for the heterogeneous patterns that we see across, across countries. So to that end, um, this figure shows you the employment rates for men aged 45 to 54 and 55 to 64, um, respectively, uh, in two samples, two subsamples, where the first subsample includes Australia, Canada, Ireland, Japan, Norway, and the US, and the second sample, Finland, France, Germany, Italy, and Sweden. And for now, let's just note that this partition is based on the extent of institutional changes leading up to, to the mid-90s. So there's, there's many things that we could talk about in relation to the figure, but let me point out the, a key, key observation. Um, so looking at um, the employment dynamics for the 45 to 54 year olds, you'll see that the changes are, are very similar across the, the two, two samples. But looking at the employment rates of 55 to 64 year olds, we see much more dramatic changes for the countries in, in sample two relative to sample one. Now, if it were the case that um, these countries in sample, sample two uh, in, uh, implemented temporary uh, reforms that uh, in response to, to the common shock that amplified um, the effects for, for, the, for the older individuals, only to scale those back uh, following the mid 90s, that would, would account for, for the patterns shown here. And what we argue in the paper uh, is that that's exactly what happened. And we provide, provide evidence uh, in support of that for, for a set of, set of countries. So much previous research on older individuals has focused on permanent features of, of social security. We argue that the most relevant policy changes in this context are temporary changes to what we call shadow social security systems or what in fact created so-called shadow social security systems, uh, facilitating re uh, retirement for individuals uh, prior, effective retirement prior to the, the official retirement age. Johanna, two minutes, two minutes left. Thank you, perfect. Um, so there's myriad and diverse uh, uh, differences across countries in these institutional changes. Uh, we document uh, relevant, relevant features for, for a subset of countries, particularly European countries in the paper. Here, let me simply give a few examples of the type of policies that were implemented uh, in the 70s and 80s, and then later scaled back uh, starting in the, in, in the 90s. Uh, so examples include, for example, allowing older workers to receive unemployment benefits for longer duration, creating a bridge to the official retirement age, granting disability benefits for, for labor market reasons rather than just health reasons, uh, granting laid off workers early social security if firms replace an individual with, with a younger worker. And note that in some instances, these policies uh, these policy changes were really uh, a change in how a policy was, was interpreted rather than, you know, uh, any change to statutory um, policy. So we focused on the age group 55 to, to 64. Uh, and of course, we showed some evidence for, for younger age groups because we thought that, that found that, that informative to compare. But you could, of course, ask, what about older individuals? So take, for example, 65 to 69 year olds. They're, in fact, impacted by formal rather than shadow social security systems. So one would expect that in countries with modest reforms to shadow social security, the employment rates for men aged 55 to 64 and men aged 65 to 69 would largely be driven by, by common factors. And thus, you would expect uh, the uh, changes in employment rates for these two age groups to be highly correlated. Conversely, in countries with sizable reforms to shadow social security, you would have expect those reforms to have a big impact on the, age, on, on the age group 55 to 64, and thus you would expect the changes for these two age groups uh, to exhibit a much lower correlation. And that's indeed what, what we find. 
uh, providing further, further support of, of our narrative. So let me, let me conclude uh, by saying that we, we offer a new narrative for understanding the changes in male employment rates um, over time. Uh, we argue that much of the decline between the, the 1970s and the mid 90s is a result of, of a negative shock to, to aggregate labor markets and temporary policy measures that amplified uh, the effects of that, that common shock for, for older men. And, Thus, much of the increase post mid 90s really reflects a reversion to the mean rather than, than a new trend. Now, our approach is purposely one of a, of a broad brush strokes uh, nature, uh, and is thus really just constitutes a first step in understanding these, these patterns. Uh, much, much interesting work, work remains. Uh, certainly interesting to delve deeper into the country level micro data and the, and the institutional uh, differences and details there. Uh, certainly many interesting policy questions remain like the study of, of the welfare implications of, of changing employment patterns for, for older men. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our first discussion uh, is Mir Zhamovic. Thanks, uh, Eric. Uh, let me share my screen. And hopefully we are live. Are we good? Great. Thanks. Thanks uh, for inviting me to discuss this really interesting paper. I learned a lot uh, from it. And um, some of the things I'm going to say will repeat or perhaps shed uh, my own thoughts about uh, what Johanna was presenting and some will complement. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of uh, the way I think the context and importance of the paper. And I really think it's an important paper. Um, you know, facing aging populations, almost all OECD countries implemented uh, reforms to their public pension systems in recent years. And actually, if you look a little bit uh, at the details, about half of these reforms target work incentives among older workers. I think really understanding and di diving into how such reforms affect the labor market is crucial. And I agree with Johanna's kind of last comment. I think this paper is really the first step in an exciting uh, new research agenda. So thank you for the opportunity to discuss this. Um, there are two parts, and let me just go quickly over what the authors do in the paper. In terms of data, uh, the authors show rather convincingly the employment rate of older men, 55 to 64, displays a U-shaped pattern over the last four decades. And what is really interesting that this pattern is surprisingly common across many advanced economies, hinting that there is a common explanation that could be responsible. At the same time, more nuanced, the reversal magnitude across countries varies. So the authors basically have a three parts uh, uh, hypothesis. I call it institutions one. There were some provisions that favored early retirement in many countries in the 70s and the 80s. Then there is a mean reverting aggregate shock. And I think the new part, as Johanna was emphasizing towards the end of the talk, what I call institutions two, there are variations in reform institutional changes that led to an amplified recovery in a subset of countries. So what I'm going to try and do uh, in my two-part discussion, I'm going to dive into the US experience, okay? And I agree with authors. I think really the, the big narrative is looking across countries, but by diving into the US experience, I'll be able to look at some covariates that perhaps when you look at so many countries, you kind of don't have that uh, ability. Johanna mentioned at the end, let's look at some micro data. That's exactly what I'm going to do. We didn't coordinate that comment, but I am happy Johanna mentioned that. And I think again, I want to emphasize, I agree, this is your the footnote 10 from, from the paper. I totally agree with the authors. Looking at the US per se is not the most interesting thing, but by having this ability to dive in a little bit, we can see some of the key covariate. And I actually think that the message that I will hopefully try to convince you about uh, really reinforces the message of, of the authors. And then, you know, being a student of Larry, Martin, Sergio, at the end of the day, I need to think with some model, some, some way to organize my thought. And I will put a little model in quotation marks uh, that at least for me was useful to understand what are the key uh, forces that shape the employment dynamics and kind of also use that model to see how it relates to the author's hypothesis and with some heroic assumption, I'll try to do some numbers at the end of the day, okay? So let me just dive into the data. And what I'm going to do is uh, use the micro CPS monthly data and basically cut and slice the US data along five different dimensions. Gender, is it really only about men? And Johanna touched that about the issue of gender. Age, is it really 55 to 64? Occupation, what's actually happening? Where are these people going back to work? And the role of education. Okay, and again, I want to emphasize the goal of the US data analysis is to identify the key covariates that are driving things. And I think it's informative. Hopefully you'll agree with me about the role of the institution in the story. Okay, so this is kind of what Johanna was showing you for all countries. I will show you just for the US, five age groups, men and female together. And you can see the 55 to 64 reversal here at the bottom uh, figure. 
Great. Let me just normalize things so it's more visible uh, uh, to, to the naked eye. Uh, I'm going to do everything around 94, which is like a turning point in, in the US. And again, you see this red line. This is the 55, 55 to 64, visibly different in terms of employment. Okay, as we all know, during the basically four decades uh, towards the end of the 20th century, there is an increase in labor force participation of females. Side remark, I'm going to go back and forth between labor force participation and employment rate. Unemployment is not like the, the most important thing here. The authors also, I think, are back and forth, uh, go back and forth with that, so let's go with that. The previous figure was obviously mixing genders. Let's separate, okay? Here is male, 55, 64. Again, 55 to 64 men are visibly different than the other age groups. Actually pointing that the same patterns are visible in the, in the US. Let's talk about females. Female again, 55 to 64, while all other age groups in females are converged by basically the year 2000 to their, what looks like a new steady state of course participation. Besides this age group, the 55 to 64 keep on growing. Okay, so in the US, you will see that 55 to 64, male and female are behaving distinct, uh, differentially than uh, other age groups. Okay, let me now dig a little bit into the 55 age group. And I think it's useful to break it a bit further apart because of this, perhaps you can call it the naive hypothesis. If the dynamics are driven by an aggregate shock, then one would expect a relatively continuous response across adjacent age groups. But I think this is come, for me, was a useful way to discriminate between the story about shocks versus institutions. Now, interesting stuff is going to happen. It's actually not about the 55 to 59. It's about the 60 to 64. Okay, so here's the same US men. I will show you in a second for, for female. And a bit, a bit of, you can see here, the reversal is for the 60 to 64. Okay, 50, 50, 55, 55, 55, 59 is like you know, flat as a pancake. And here, as you can see, there are the adductly sub all age groups. Here is the 55 to 59, not visibly distinct from other younger age groups. The 60, 64 is the one that's driving. And here I added a bit older age group, 65, 69, 70, 74. Okay, so I look at men, the 55, and again, this is about the US. This is just a way to organize, digging in a little bit more. In the US, when you look at men, it's actually the 60 and above that are, are driving the result. We saw before that 55 to 64 females were behaving like men. What about when you do this further age cutting? Actually the same story. Even within the 55 to 64 females, it's the 60 to 64 females. And again, I'm adding also the 65 and above females just to see that. Okay, so something on the age structure is a bit more perhaps tilting you towards older age group. For me, that rings as more the role of institutions or the importance uh, we should pay attention to that. And I think that really uh, co um, corroborates the, the, the story the authors are after. Okay, so all these guys are coming back to work. <laughs> they have to work somewhere. Let me just show you something about where they're going to work and how this is related to their education background. So what I'm going to do, I divided uh, the 60-64. I'm just going to zoom in on the 60-64 male and female. And I divided it whether or not they're in the labor force. That's what you see in the top left uh, panel, not in the labor force. And then whether or not they're in routine occupations, middle skill occupations, the author drawn kind of characterization, non-routine manual, so in the left tail of the weight distribution, and non-routine cognitive. Hopefully all of us in this session belong to the non-routine cognitive, okay? And what you see is again, what you see in the top left per, uh, panel is the reduction in the not in the labor force increasing the employment rate, exactly in the spirit that we're talking about. And what you see that this is by the time basically that the reversal begins, the routine occupations are kind of where that's it, we converge. All the action is coming in this non-routine cognitive in the right tail of the wage distribution, okay? Similar story comes uh, for females. It's really about a ratio of about four to one, five to one between non-routine cognitive and non-routine manual. So all these entrants, and this is not exactly entrants, it's not the same people, different cohorts, but you know, abusing the, the, the notion of what are entrants. There is a ratio that are entering four mainly into non-routine cognitive. I put a caveat, there are known issues to everyone who works with this uh, uh, occupation uh, data about creating time series of occupation because of redesign, et cetera. But I feel pretty comfortable that those, I think are, are the message is, is, is there that it's mainly a story about non-routine cognitive. Okay, so it looks like a 60 plus non-routine cognitive, not gender specific type of shock. Okay, but now when you think about non-routine cognitive, what is the role of education? That's the first thing that you jump to you. I'm going to look at two things in education. I'm going to look at propensity. So what is the employment rate within education age groups? Okay, and then I'm going to see about the share of education, which I think Johanna also mentioned towards the end of her discussion. <laughs> this is 
age groups, again, the same age groups as before, and I broke it by education. It's going to be a less than high school, that will be the L group, and high school and some college, that will be the M, and H, which is going to be college and above. And what you see for men, again, it's the 60 to 64 from a very specific education group. It's the high education group. Okay. Again, I emphasize it. This might not hold to other countries, but I think even when we think about the U.S., this is telling us something about what are the forces, what are the groups that are exhibiting this reversal. So all what we were seeing before about 664 is men, for the, for the men, it's 664 who work in higher education. Again, this is where we see this U-shape. Okay. For females, it's a bit more, uh, you know, the data is a bit noisier. We see it again, the 60 to 64, the ones that are driving it. And you see that it's in the middle education group and in the high education group. Okay. So for the first point for 5A, the propensity effect for men, it's about uh, high education uh, men, 50, 60 to 64, that started to increase uh, their uh, employment propensity. In the interest of time, I'm not going to show you, there's also composition effect. In that age group, there is over time more and more highly educated uh, within the age group of, of men, which because highly educated men tend to work more than lower educated, that's also pushing the employment rate. So there's both a composition effect and a propensity effect. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show you that. Okay, so I think the first thing we see, we see this reversal in employment in the US. We see it not only in male, it's in both genders. It's not the 55 to 64, it's the 60 plus. It's not across the board. It's mainly not in cognitive. And at least for men, the education, both two channels of the education seem to play a crucial role. And again, I want to emphasize, I think the value of the US data is suggesting key for virus that would be useful, that are responsible for the reversal, and would be useful to look at uh, the context of other countries, okay? And to me, this seems to be, uh, the, the importance of institutions uh, seems to be emerging from this uh, data analysis. Okay, what about the mean reversal shock? You do see something in the US. This is log wages for male, normalized by the turning point, by age group. And there is something interesting that we see kind of in the mid 90s, exactly when the reversal and deployment occurs, there is this rise in, in, in wages. They don't look distinct across age groups, okay? They seem to be rather similar. Different cuts, again, will give you the same story, okay? So again, to the naked eye or to the naive hypothesis, this seems to be something about institution versus shock because we don't see any uh, distinct behavior. Or, um, we don't see the other age groups behaving in a similar way to the 60, 64, okay? I'm going to, to skip this. There is a large literature in micro literature that I was happy to learn in the last few years. I enjoyed basically showing social security reforms, three major ones, changes to full retirement age, delayed retirement credit and earning test elimination that people argue, as always is the case, that can extend between 20% and 100% of the reversal. But the narrative is there about the, the role of institution. Okay, let, let me skip that. What I want to do in the, my remaining eight minutes I really wanted to think about what are institution changes because that's kind of the, I think the new fact uh, that uh, the paper is pushing out. And I want to understand what are changes in institutions, okay? And I think one of the things that hopefully I will try to convince you is we really have to be careful about elasticities, which is going to be how this ch the changes matter to employment rate and how they depend on the context, okay? As I mentioned, I try to make some heroic assumptions to get some numbers. So I try to write the following model, hopefully capturing the, the spirit of the, the exercise. It's whether or not to work for one more period or retire, okay? So there is a value of working for one more period, and I'm going to think that uh, we have different abilities. Uh, that's going to be the epsilon, drawn for some distribution. So in the same time that I write one paper, Richard, write, uh, Richard and Johanna write 10 JPs, okay? So they have a high epsilon, I have a low epsilon. Our wage, there is an efficiency, efficiency wage, and we're all facing a, 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 some labor tax rate. And there is some working disutility. I'm going to put it like that to avoid wealth effect, just so to make the analysis cleaner. And then after that, I retire. So it's a one period short game. And if I retire, I get some benefits, could or could not be indexed to the wage. I will show that this matters a lot, actually. There are going to be some benefit tax rate. Again, I retire. As you already see, this will lead to some type of cutoff participation ruling ability. Okay, so we will have something that defines this epsilon star. People above epsilon star work, people below epsilon star don't work. This implies that given that epsilon is coming from some distribution, the employment rate is just one minus the CDF in the employment. Okay, cool. So this is how the model works. We have on the y-axis the employment rate, one minus the CDF, and here's an example. This is not a coincidence that I'm looking at this. This would be the numerical case will target one of the groups I was talking about before that has an employment rate of about 76%. 
But what you see is that this would be the cutoff, and then we will have all, uh, employment rate of about 76%. What is the cutoff? I did two, uh, two models here, benefit index to wage ability. Some countries actually have benefits that are indexed to the ability and or to the last uh, wage, and some countries actually have benefits that are constant. Okay, so here's two cases like that. And the way I interpreted the story about institutions is the following thing. There are a bunch of things in this model. There are three institutional things, benefit that could decrease, benefit tax that could increase, or wage on tax that could decrease. All of these things are going to change epsilon star. In this case, we'll make it lower. And employment rate would go up, okay? So those are, that's the way it is I was thinking about the paper in terms of what are changes in institutions. But this is just part of the story, obviously, because we're interested in the employment change, this hat, this log uh, deviations. And it's not just about the epsilon hat, it's not just about this change, the horizontal change, it's also how that is going to be translated to e hat. So here are two cases, I took basically two CDFs, two di ab ab different abilities, okay? And what you see for the same change in epsilon, for the same institutional change, we're going to have actually very different mapping naturally to the employment rate. In this case, because the PDF is flatter, we're going to have a smaller change in employment. In this case, because it's steeper, we're going to have a higher change, okay? So separating the institutional change from how it transmits to E to E hat, I think we need to understand the actual, actually how those elasticities vary across countries and how actually they are institution dependent. Don't get scared. This is just, you know, my favorite activity, log linearizing. But I think it tells us, uh, well, within economics, my favorite activity. Um, this is telling us something about how to think about, about the changes, how they map, okay? So it's not just about the hats. It's not just about the institution, the, the variables, you know, that are changing. It's also how they transmit. And as we can see, the elasticity itself is institutional dependent. This is, for example, the net pension replacement rate. That's an institutional detail, okay? Epsilon star, the cutoff, depends on the ability distribution, but also obviously on the institution that determines whether or not uh, you are retiring. Okay, so one thing, the message is, I think this idea of changes versus transmission, we need to, to, to think about how to clarify that. And, and the authors are obviously very uh, aware of that. Who am I to teach them at this point? But, you know, I think just in terms of when we try to think about how a certain change matters to employment, we have to think about uh, these channels as well. Okay, so then I try to put some numbers. Bear with me, you know, it's heroic assumptions. But what I wanted to show that this little model actually enables us to gauge some of these key uh, policy elasticities. Now, for many countries, let's go back to that, there are no elasticities about the different reforms. I really enjoyed the case of Finland, learned a lot about Finland from the paper, but you know, how many elasticity reforms are out there? This model tells you actually you don't need that. If you know, we're willing to go a little bit with economic theory, we can recover those. So for many countries, there are no elasticity estimates to different reforms. But for many countries, it's quite common to actually estimate elasticity with respect to the wage. And what we can do is we can use this little model to recover then the elasticity uh, to the, um, the policy reform. I think it's valuable what we're doing here, and I'm sure the authors will come with much better models than this little one, to, to, to gauge the effect. So let me just show you how we do that. First, let me think of, I'm going to think about, let me first make a quick point. The elasticity with respect to the wage that I interpret that as the aggregate shock, even that is institution dependent. You can see here that in a model where the benefits are indexed to wage and ability, you're going to have another factor floating around versus the world that the benefits are constant. And certainly there is variation in the type of institutions across countries. So that's a perfect. Two Let minutes, me go with the near, first. near two minutes. Perfect, perfect, <laughs> 20 minutes. Thanks, Eric, great. So <laughs> let me try just to put some numbers. There are three things, let me go with the first case. There is something about net pension replacement rate. This is this, this is the benefit to the wage after tax. There is something about the ability distribution and there's something about the employment rate. If I can get all of those, I can actually go ahead and run uh, with the elasticity uh, for reforms. Here's net pension replacement rate before countries have been affiliated with. I live in Switzerland. I was before 20 years in the US. I was born in Israel and my parents are from Argentina. So you just go to the OECD 2018, but this, that's a key number from what the model was telling us. I'm not going to bother you how to estimate the ability distribution. It's you use the idea that uh, Richard and Jan are 10 times more uh, productive than me. So how the wages should be reflecting that. And then basically from some observed truncated distribution of the wage, you can recover parameters about that. Okay, good. We recover the ability distribution. And I'm going to tell this model, I want you to match the elasticity 
of employment with respect to wages. So I took two countries, okay? I took a male 55 to 64 education above high school for the year 2012. These are the two years, that's, that's the group where I had Israel and the US kind of numbers. So I went with that. And here, I basically have all the numbers I need. I have uh, the NPR, the net, uh, pension replacement. I have the employment rate of that group. I have the standard deviation of wages. That again, allows me to recover the ability. And I have the elasticity of a respect to wages. Interestingly, the fantastic paper by Supporter and co-authors, they found in Israel, there seems to be 0.43. That's exactly the maximum value in Chetty's paper. So let's go with 0.43 for both countries. And then voila, I got what is the standard deviation of ability. I got what is the mean ability. I got what's the epsilon star. And now, I can just plug those things and get uh, elasticity of different reforms. I have what is the elasticity for benefit reforms in the US versus Israel. I have what elasticity with respect to different taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is just a way now to gauge. We don't have to go and start uh, estimating everything. Eric, I know I have 10 seconds, I'll be um, wrapping up. Okay, so this is just a way through the model to emphasize how these elasticities matter. It's not just about the epsilon hat. Okay, so. I think the US data was suggesting the value of zooming in on covariates, whose employment is reversing. And I think it's really consistent with the important role of institution. And I think this model is highlighting what exactly are institutions. Okay, I think that's where we need to dig in the, the next step about changes versus elasticity. And the model was giving us a way to consider other reform by basically plug and play by matching uh, um, elasticity with respect to the wage. And I really look forward to work that I think quantifies the role of institution. I think that's the next step. Uh, hopefully the authors agree with me. That's my reading of their conclusion in the point reversal. And I think really it's an important, first order importance uh, research topic given the demographic transition that uh, we're facing. Thank you. I was engrossed and I forgot I had to do a work. Thank you very much. And our next discussant is, is Mark Bill. Uh, I enjoyed the opportunity to read and think about the paper. I enjoyed Nair's discussion. Uh, so um, Richard and uh, Joanna highlight this, these striking trends. I already talked about that, uh, and they discuss uh, possible explanations. Especially this complementarity of leisure, uh, negative shocks, and the rise and fall of distortionary transfers. Uh, I was rooting for the complementarity of leisure. It was a very romantic story, I thought, of these couples, you know, coordinating their, their leisure. Uh, I wasn't surprised they didn't quite find it. It doesn't mean there's not complementarity because there's a strong wealth effect with the spouses working more that the, uh, that the men then retire. It's sort of like the, um, you know, the added worker effects you used to hear about. Then they have a discussion of negative shocks and then the rise and fall of the distortionary transfers. I, I think for the negative shocks, this is, uh, I would have I just highlight that it's not obvious that these negative shocks would have reduced employment. Uh, there's wealth and substitution effects, and I don't, I don't think necessarily people in the 70s and 80s view these as temporary shocks. Um, it would be interesting to see what happened to the consumption of these older households, not just their, their wage rates. Now, there's one view of that the, the shocks are, of course, temporary for the older workers because they're going to retire, but that doesn't really hold for aggregate shocks unless you uh, don't have a bequest motive. So, there's sort of a recording equivalence that still holds uh, that there'll still be a wealth effect for older workers. And then they discuss this uh, rise and fall of the distortionary transfers. So all very interesting. I, I don't have uh, any uh, unforced errors in the paper. I feel I need to discuss. I'm gonna go the very similar route to uh, near. I'm gonna focus my discussion on one country. I picked Germany, fortunately I didn't pick the US. I picked Germany because to take advantage of the uh, SOEP, this uh, the the a long panel, which is a very nice panel data that goes back to '84. It's it's large um, for the early years. Uh, it's only West Germany, but I think everything I'm going to say is going to be uh, robust to uh, to uh, uh, excluding East Germany throughout. And the nice features of this data is I can look backwards at work history of these older individuals, including retrospective questions on whether they're employed at 30, 40, or 50. So I'm gonna be able to sort of go pretty directly into sort of cohort effect issues. And it also has rich data on um, not just the employment hours and earnings, but also transfers, 
and then the household assets, although that's only after 2002. Okay, so before I jump into what I'm gonna discuss, I just wanna highlight that the patterns are pretty striking for Germany. Uh, so these are the employment population rates, just similar what, uh, what Joanna showed for the, for the broader set of samples. Um, and you can see the, the fall is a little less pronounced for the, for the men, but the rise is actually sharper. And to me, I think the, the most puzzling or the most interesting thing is the rise rather than the fall. Uh, it holds true pretty similarly for annual hours, not just employment. And then um, as they were sort of implying, it's much stronger for, uh, uh, for older individuals. So for men, you can see this, this rise in annual hours um, by these different age groups. The other age groups are actually having a decline uh, while theirs is rising. For, for women, all the groups are rising, but for the older women, you get this convergence where they're clearly catching up. Okay, so what, what I wanna do with my discussion is I wanna first uh, ask, you know, if this possibly re reflects cohort factors and, and both uh, Tron and Nairds sort of talked about this. I'm gonna mirror Nairds just, you know, excellent discussion, uh, various points. But there, you know, potentially you have strong cohort effects. You have, you know, trends in life expectancy, schooling, occupations. Uh, you know, in Germany, the experience growing up for the, Early part of the sample, I'm going to show 80. You're growing up in the 30s versus 50s or 70s. Arguably, growing up in Germany in the 30s could look quite different than, than in the 70s. Uh, and then also allows me to control for this past work history. And then after that, I'm just going to turn to talking about substitution of wealth effects, uh, the patterns in wages and wage growth, patterns in assets, and then a little bit about changing policies in, tech, in transfers. Okay, so some possible cohort factors. One would be rising uh, life expectancy. I'm not gonna spend any more time on that. It, it, it increases throughout in Germany, but at a slower rate after 2000. And so I don't think, uh, I don't think that's a natural channel. Uh, rising schooling attainments. Schooling attainments a powerful force for uh, working more when you're old. If you take a, you know, the simplest thought of schooling is we have more schooling in a, a particular generation. Uh, you get higher earnings, but you start later and in, in, uh, there shouldn't principle be an envelope condition where there's no wealth effect of that extra schooling. So I think it would be very easy to calibrate a model where an extra year of schooling translates it maybe even to more than one more year of, of working late in life. And you can see the attainments grew very rapidly and they actually started growing particularly rapidly when the employment rates started turning around. Again, Remember, these are the, these are the uh, attainments for the 55 to 64 year olds. So uh, it's just a slice of this group at each time period. If that's not clear, I'll, I'll, I'll state it again, but that's, this is the trend for that particular group. Um, now, having said that, you see, you really still see, uh, again, Nears found something different for the US, but you see these trends for both schooling groups. Here, I just break it into greater than 12 years and less than or equal to 12 years. And you can see there's a, a rise for the, uh, these again, all the older workers, these are the men 55 to 64 year old. You see a strong rise for both groups. Uh, neither group rises quite as much as the, is the green line, which is what was for overall because it does have this compositional effect, but it's not much driven by compositional effects. You see strong rises for both groups. And the same holds true for women. Uh, there's many more of these po population are in the 12 years or less, so it's, it's gonna largely mimic, um, the, the, the group for them largely mimics this, but the, the ones with more education increase also. So it's not just a, a compositional effect, I don't think. Okay, so, um, uh, we touched on the possible cohort factors. I think it appears that the cohort factors do not explain much of the phenomena. That's consistent uh, with what the authors said. So in particular, there's a V-shape uh, in this, this employment is, is relative to an individual's earlier life cycle employment, in particular relative to employment status at age 50. So I could have controlled for fixed effects, so I did something very similar but simpler, similar but simpler, which is uh, controlled for employment status at age 50. But first I'll just show these figures. These are for the men, 55 to 64. So we know they have this V-shape in their employment. But if you look at their employment rates at 30 or when they were 40 or when they were 50, um, 
those those aren't increasing. So it's not like these. It's in fact later in the years where the employment's increasing at the older ages. Those were the cohorts that actually showed sort of declines in employment um, earlier here. Somewhat similar for women. And then finally, this is the one I want to show is this. This breaks down again. This is the this is the uh, figure for before. This is the employment population rate for all men. Um, um, at 55 to 64. But now I'm giving separate lines based on employment status at 50 to 54. So there's a group here that weren't employed at 50 to 54. They're a fairly small group and they, their employment doesn't rise over time. That is their employment at 55 to 64 stays kind of zero, conditional that they didn't work from 50 to 54. Whereas if I focus only on those who work 50 to 54, then you get this very clear V shape, okay? which is saying when you, you know, when you control for this sort of history of work, you actually get a much more striking V shape. That's particularly true for women. So if I, again, I have two lines now, one for women who weren't employed at uh, 50 to 54 and another one for those who were, and here again is the total. So this takes out, this is a compositional effect of these two groups. And you can see that if I only focus on the women who were act, actually employed in 50 to 54, you see a very, very striking fall from like 0.8 down to 0.4 and then back up to 0.8. So I think this reinforces their message that it's not a cohort effect for Germany. Okay, so then I, I wanna um, talk a little bit about substitution and wealth effects. Um, I don't have consumption data. I'd, ideally, I'd look at consumption, um, you know, wages relative to consumption. That would be like the natural thing I think to look at. Uh, but I'm going to look at uh, some evidence on wages and on, on uh, assets. So if I look at the median, uh, I'm using the median real wage at ages 50 to 54. So I'm using uh, the wages at 50 to 54 just to try to limit a selection effect that over time, you, as the employment rates are falling and going up, you might get a selection of the type of workers. And you see uh, these in hourly wages in euros in 20, 2018 euros. And there is, you know, some increase in the real wage. It's uh, not enormous, greater for women. Also, you don't see that the wages are growing more lap rapidly later in the career. That's, that's one thing that would tend to drive up the labor supply for the older men is that, you know, whatever their history of wages, you see sort of an acceleration in their wage growth or, you know, a better wage growth later in life. Didn't really see that in the German data. In terms of assets, you do see a, a pretty clear decline in median assets. Uh, again, I'm taking the assets at 50 to 54, so they're not influenced by the employment decision in 55 to 64. And you can see, particularly during, excuse me, particularly during the Great Recession, there's this decline. But there is this secular decline in median household assets, not in mean household assets, because there's an upper tail that tended to have their assets grow pretty rapidly. But there is this drop in assets. And there's a, definitely a, a drop in median assets held at 50 to 54 relative to the median earnings at you know, 50 to 54. Um, and these are not trivial drops. Um, so this is a drop of about 50% um, for the women and then pretty much 50% for the men if I just judge the assets relative to uh, earnings. Now in the literature, I mean, it's very clear. I mean, one thing we know, there's a clear wealth effect on labor supply, and so there should be a clear negative effect uh, of assets on labor supply or a positive effect of a decline in assets. Um, that's, that's, different, uh, that's difficult to highlight in the data because of the heterogeneity. Households that tend to save more uh, also tend to work more. One of the reasons they work more is because they want to save more. Um, but I will just mention that uh, um, Natalia uh, Gimpelson is working on a project uh, with this data related to retirements. And I, I'll just highlight just sort of a side thing she found is when you instrument for assets, uh, centers paribus, but, but instrument with whether you grew up in East Germany or grew up in West Germany as an instrument for having fewer assets, the individuals who grew up in East Germany have fewer assets. You do see a clear wealth effect of those assets on the, on retirement decisions. She's looking at retirement decisions. Um, now I'm going to turn to how much time do I have, Eric? Uh, 
Four and a half minutes, five okay. minutes. We'll call okay, it. So I'm going to finish by talking about the unemployment benefits um, and particularly the pensions. So you can see there's this clear decline in, in, uh, um, and this doesn't go back as far. So this is starting in 95. So you should view all this with respect to the period when the, when the uh, employment rates for the older workers are growing. So you can see that the mean of the unemployment benefits are declining, particularly for, for men. Now, of course, that also is gonna reflect, you know, for whatever reason, the, the men are working more, you're gonna see a decline in these benefits. Um, if I look at the median unemployment benefits condition on receiving them, uh, that doesn't show uh, so much of a, of a trend. Now, if I look at the mean of the old age and disability pensions, there you get this really nice, you know, um, reverse U, which is sort of the inverse of the employment rates that uh, Joanna and Richard were, were highlighting, particularly for men. Uh, and if you look at the median, you do see this is the median uh, old age and disability pensions conditional on receiving, and you do see a pretty significant decline. And then the last I'll say here on this is if I look at the, the mean pension for um, whether you're employed or uh, not employed, you also see uh, uh, it's just actually a, a fairly significant decline. This is um, the differential. I'm going to focus on just one line. Uh, for women, you don't really see this, but for men, you see, you know, up here a 15, uh, 1500 euro a month higher pension. If you look at just the, the men who aren't working versus working, and that declines over time. And that's going to reflect these reforms, including reforms that allow you to sort of keep working maybe and still collect pensions, which all work in the direction of encouraging employment. Um, if I look at employment population separating uh, older men by age, um, you see that both the, um, all the groups rise, all of them show this pattern. Um, this is for men, but particularly those 60 to 62 and those 63 uh, to 64. Now, the reason I highlight that is there's just like a, there's a reform to the system like every six months, I think, in Germany. But uh, a couple of big ones was a, a reform in 1997 and a reform that occurred in 2000. It's usually called a 2001 reform and it came in stepwise. So the 97 one uh, uh, raised the retirement age uh, for insured uh, pensions, so not disability. And so it would be natural to see a rise uh, in employment then for those um, 63 to 64 starting in 97. I think you could argue you see something like that. Um, this this uh, change in the disability retirement age from 60 to 63 that's kicking in starting in 2000 or 2001, you should see it's changed here for this group. And in fact, you do see a pretty significant change for the, the group 60, uh, 60 to 62, even relative to the other groups, starting with that reform in, in 2000. And again, it wasn't a one-time reform, it was stepped up. So you would expect this sort of trend pattern. Mark, two minutes, two minutes now. Okay, well, I'm gonna sum up then. I had 20 more slides, but since I have two minutes. So. <laughs> okay, so we see um, rising employment for older men the last 25 years that departs from history. Uh, possible causes, um, I think it's, pretty clear from their work, uh, what NIR showed and what other papers in the literature have shown that these policy changes apparently did matter. Labor supply does matter for employment. Um, I, hi I highlight that even though we're not meeting in Cambridge this year, but uh, labor supply does matter for employment. And uh, I also think this wealth relative to potential earnings probably mattered also, at least for Germany. And then the last thing I'll mention, this echoes what Nero was saying. I think probably there are other important factors that mattered. Um, and one of them is gonna be this changing nature of the work versus non-work for older individuals. So I don't have as good of a figure by this uh, 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 rote work versus less rote work. But you do see with this turnover is a period where um, the white collar employment for the men, it's, it's holds for the women, not quite as strongly starts taking off. And so back here in 95, you have, um, you know, only a little over nearly three times as many in uh, the blue collar jobs to the white collar jobs, whereas here, you know, we've switched it and there's a, there's a clear majority in the uh, white collar jobs. So that's gonna change the nature of work. It's just 
you know, the whole distinction between leisure and working, market and non-market work is a lot less striking for, for certain jobs than others. And then also it's going to change, it, even, even beyond what the, the, the individual's labor supply decision, when you have an aggregate change in this and, and you're encouraging older workers to work and the work is becoming that way, the whole, the whole employer-employee relationship is going to change. Uh, what sort of asked of workers at different ages is going to change. They're going to become more flexible to have, you know, workers stay along longer, uh, be less productive in their older ages, even though they stay around longer. Uh, and then the, the whole wage growth and the comp compensation scheme has plenty of flexibility for these sort of, sort of long-term changes to just, you know, rework how the compensation scheme works over the life cycle, I would argue, especially for the uh, salary and white collar type jobs. So I'm done. Thanks again.